Um, so our last uh, speaker for this session is Professor Stephen Graves. He is an orthopaedic surgeon and professor of arthroplasty at Flinders University. And he has been director of the Australian Orthopaedic Association National Joint Replacement Registry since it was established in 1999. And he's going to give us some insight into that registry. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be able to present some uh, information with respect to the Australian National Joint Replacement Registry, which is one of the um, oldest registries in Australia. It was established back in 1999, and I think that it's had a significant impact on the outcome of joint replacement surgery in this country. And uh, so thanks very much for the invitation to present today. This is my disclosure slide. I'm the director of the Australian uh, Joint Registry. And the registry is actually owned by the Australian Orthopaedic Association, but is funded by the Australian Federal Government through a legislated cost recovery program. It is an absolute AOA requirement that has uh, my position as director that I have no real or potential conflicts. What is a registry? Registries are continuous quality assurance programs and they are national or large regional uh, uh, based. Uh, many people claim uh, to have registries but uh, uh, size is actually a very critical factor in the ability of a registry to identify uh, differences in outcome and that's why I've emphasised national and large regional. And very importantly registries are integrated within the healthcare system and they are appropriately designed, governed and managed to ensure that they bring about significant improvement in health outcomes. That's their purpose. As mentioned uh, by Sue in the previous uh, presentation, um, there is a continuous quality improvement mechanism established when registries uh, uh, are implemented. They collect data, they validate that data, they, uh, uh, make sure uh, about the completeness and the accuracy of the data. They then undertake appropriate analysis informed uh, with uh, the appropriate expertise to identify differences in practice. And then they report those differences. And then what the registry does is monitor the impact of what uh, has been reported so that you can see change. And that's very important. So you can see that registries are actually set up to produce translational change in healthcare. For those who aren't fully aware of the uh, uh, National Joint Replacement Registry, as I mentioned, it's fully owned by the Orthopaedic Association. Data commenced back in 1999 and uh, was fully implemented uh, nationally in 2002. It's funded by the federal government, as I mentioned, and, uh, and that was legislated back in 2009 uh, and what was legislated was a cost recovery process to fund the registry. So, in fact, although we have a contract with the federal government, there, it is no cost to the government because they recover that cost and they recover it from industry. And that was updated in 2015. The registry, since its implementation, has been listed as a federal quality insurance activity, and that's very important in getting collaboration of all surgeons uh, within the Australian community. It has had a major impact, as I'll show you, on uh, uh, joint replacement surgery, both nationally and internationally. We are currently based at the South Australian uh, Health and Medical Research Institute in Adelaide. Uh, we were originally associated with the University of Adelaide and had a very productive relationship for 16 years. Over the last year, we have developed uh, a fantastic relationship with SAMRI. It's an excellent organisation to be involved in, and that... Uh, uh, we also partner with the University of South Australia and that uh, partnership is very important because it is about developing uh, registry science which is a, a very growing area uh, both within this country but also internationally. Uh, just a, a quick overview of the registry. Uh, we collect data from all uh, private and public hospitals that are undertaking joint replacement in this country and that's 310. There is a 100% participation of surgeons. Uh, there was a question about um, uh, consent, and we introduced the opt-off consent way back in 1999. And since that time, out of the 1.2 million uh, procedures that we re recorded, we've actually had 40 patients opt off from the program. 
The, we have data on over 99% of the procedures, and that's validated against uh, government data. And uh, joint replacement has been increasing at 5 to 7% per year, and currently there's over 100,000 procedures. In another 10 years, this is, that is expected to double. As I mentioned, we have uh, information on almost 1.2 million procedures, uh, 500,000 hips and uh, almost 600,000 knee procedures. But also, uh, we commenced collection on shoulder procedures uh, back in 2008, and we now actually have the largest uh, registry in the world on, on shoulder procedures. We also collect additional information on elbow, wrist, ankle, and spinal uh, disc replacement. We actually have information on over 600 million individual prosthesis uh, uh, components so when you consider both catalogue and lot number variation. The headline assessment of what the registry has been able to achieve, uh, the easiest way to look at this is the revision burden. And the revision burden in Australia has actually decreased quite uh, uh, dramatically and that's actually different from other countries where the revision burden over this period has actually increased for many countries. Uh, in Australia, uh, we have declined uh, the revision burden with hip replacement from 13.1% to 9.6% and with respect to knee replacement, 88 .8 to 74 Now, that may not sound like a lot, but remember there's 100,000 procedures done a year. And the, uh, our assessment of the benefit uh, uh, that that has uh, brought to the Australian community is over $600 million savings. And uh, there's an economic evaluation coming out, uh, as mentioned, uh, next week, and I would be very surprised if uh, that independent system, uh, assessment uh, finds uh, anything different to that. I just might point out that that saving has been achieved with $13 million of investment. Clearly, there's also flow-on savings uh, internationally because Australia is actually only 2% of the global market and many of our findings have actually been uh, um, taken up and implemented uh, with respect to policy change uh, uh, internationally. So our purpose is to collect quality clinical evidence that can be used to identify and monitor the effects of factors impacting on the outcome of joint replacement surgery and provide that information to relevant stakeholders to enable action and continuous beneficial change. To establish an effective registry, it's very important that there is clinical leadership by the professional body and respected clinicians to ensure clinician buy-in. Uh, it has to be transparent and uh, have transparent and accountable governance and sustainable and adequate funding. It is very important that uh, developing registries learn from the uh, established successful registries about what is required to implement a registry and ensure data quality through minimum data set collection, data linkage and data validation. Importantly, uh, registries need to provide information and relevant analysis to all stakeholders involved in decision making. So we provide information to surgeons, uh, to consumers, to government health departments, government regulators, hospitals and healthcare systems, medical device companies and health insurance. And we do that both nationally and internationally. The way that we do this is through the publication of um, uh, publicly available annual reports on the website. And there are, in fact, 15 separate reports that are produced each year. Uh, we also provide access to information, uh, secure stakeholder specific internet access to surgeons, so surgeons can look at their own comparative data. Uh, we pro also provide that to regulators, both within Australia and overseas, and government and industry. And in particular, industry can monitor the outcome of all of their devices being used uh, in real time. Uh, and, that, uh, and that has been very important uh, at ensuring that uh, quality devices are being used in this country. We also do up to 300 or so ad hoc reports. These are individual requests that come to us for specific information that we have not uh, previously presented, and they come from government, industry, surgeons and research organisations, again, both nationally and internationally. We also, as I mentioned, uh, uh, have stakeholder-specific uh, websites. Factors required for effective translation, and I think that this is something that we know quite a lot about because uh, we have been in this business now for 17 years. And there are a number of very important factors to achieve successful translation of the data that you produce. First of all and foremost is actually ownership of the data 
and the second issue is data quality. Those two are the, actually the most important factors that bring about clinical change. Availability and delivery of high quality current information to all stakeholders is critical. They need to know what is happening actually in real time. And very importantly, the information that you provide has to be integrated into the decisions made within healthcare systems, including policy decisions. The other thing that is very, very important is the international collaboration and establishment of international networks. There are many factors that influence the outcome of joint replacement surgery. Patient, surgeon, operative, hospital and prosthesis specific factors are all important. And in fact, the final result of the outcome is a complex interaction between all of these. The registry is able to assess the relative importance of each of these factors when there is a variation in performance and therefore provide insight into the reasons for outcome variation. Almost all major improvements in joint replacement globally that have occurred in the last 10 years have actually occurred not because of clinical trials, but because of registry data. If I just give you a couple of quick examples, device factors. Uh, the uh, joint registry assessment of devices is really a simultaneous comparison of all devices within the national setting. And there are a lot of devices. We have over 2,000 different combinations of hip prosthesis and over 500 combinations of knee prosthesis that have been reported to the registry. There are differences in outcome for individual devices and related to device specific features as well as also variation in outcome uh, with respect to whole classes of devices. Patient and surgeon factors are always considered when considering the performance of the device and are important for some of these. Statistically about 85% of devices perform the same as the best performing device in a particular class. However, of the remaining 15, some of those, 5%, have a much higher rate of revision. And these are what we refer to as outlier devices. If we look at new processes that have been introduced into the Australian market over the last, uh, uh, over the 10 year period between 2003 and 2012, there were 500 new hip and knee pr processes introduced. 30% were in fact were not used in sufficient numbers to actually make an assessment, but when you aggregate this particular group, you find that performance of these small use uh, prosthesis is actually quite poor. Almost 40% of the other prosthesis that we could assess, however, had a worse outcome than previously available devices. 60% had the same outcome. Of the 500, we identified one device in the last 10 years that has actually improved the outcome of joint replacement. And this is actually a very important finding. And it's been very important at a global level because it's impacted on the regulation of devices, uh, not only within this country, but also internationally. I'll just give you an example of uh, one particular outlier. Uh, first of all, the class of outliers. Uh, I've circular, circled uh, uh, particular prosthesis here, which is a large head metal on metal. This was used in over a million people globally. And that uh, back in 2008, the registry identified the performance of that whole class of prosthesis was significantly different from uh, other types of uh, uh, total hip replacement. And that actually resulted in the withdrawal of all prosthesis uh, with large head metal on metals uh, uh, globally. That in particular, there was one which is the subject of the largest, oh, excuse me, the largest class action uh, in Australia, uh, and that was settled last year for $250 million, and that was the ASR XL prosthesis. And you can see the performance of that device is that uh, it had a 50% revision rate at uh, 10 years, and uh, the normal revision rate at 10 years for devices is 5%. So we haven't only just identified the ASR prosthesis. Uh, over the years, we've identified over 123 prosthesis that have uh, higher uh, revision rates uh, compared to the standard prosthesis being used. And of these, most have now been removed from the market. However, we also identify the performance of uh, the better prosthesis, and this is actually very critical. And you can see that uh, with some of these prosthesis that have been used in very large numbers, the outcomes at 10 years are actually quite remarkable, with uh, 
2%, uh, 3% revision rates overall. This is patients of all ages and all conditions. And that, uh, and that is actually a very, very good outcome. With respect to hip replacement, 50% of hip prosthesis have less than 5% revision rate at 10 years. With knees, this is reduced to 25%, but it still means that there are many high quality devices available for surgeons to use and where they can be comfortable that they will get an excellent outcome. So the impact of our prosthesis data has been that most outlier prosthesis have been removed from the market. Reduced uh, uptake of new devices has occurred and increased use of better performing devices uh, um, uh, has uh, occurred. Policy changes with respect to joint replacement and prosthesis regulation and reimbursement in Australia have occurred. Integration of AOA data into regulatory and reimbursement uh, assessment processes in Australia has also occurred and clearly there has been policy change in regulation internationally. I think I'll stop there and thanks very much. So thank you, Stephen. I think that's a really amazingly powerful evidence of, of the impact of a clinical trial registry. And we might have time for one question, just while the microphone's going. I, I'm, I'm just going to ask, um, federal government funding from the get-go, how easy was that to secure and what did your business case look like? The, uh, oh, well, this is, is back many years ago. And in fact, the uh, federal government has uh, been supportive, as actually all uh, government organisations and the regulators within Australia have been very supportive of the registry, and that's been... Uh, very critical, but in fact it was relatively straightforward because we were able to identify that there was significant variation in performance and that the orthopaedic community was concerned. And when we went to government, it was a collaboration of both the profession and the industry that this needed to be looked at. Thank you. Do we have one more question from the floor before we break for our continuity? Hi, yeah, just Tony Keach from Sydney. Thanks for a great talk. Can I just ask whether on occasion there's merit in considering the range of movement available from a particular prosthesis, even if it has a slightly higher revision rate? Um, or some other functional aspect of yeah, a particular sure. prosthesis? And, and in fact, uh, one of the things that uh, the Australian Registry is moving into is actually looking at uh, collecting uh, functional and patient reported outcomes uh, uh, nationally and that uh, we're currently having discussions uh, uh, about that particular process. The evidence, however, is that uh, revision, when you have very large numbers, is a very good predictor of, of uh, the overall outcome because the functional and the patient-reported outcomes are actually predictive of revision. But what they do is they identify a higher subset of patients that are actually unhappy with the procedure. But also importantly, if you collect that information, both pre-op and post-op, you're able to identify that uh, uh, whether patients are also being appropriately selected for the surgery. And that's important information to feed back to surgeons. So we are moving into that area, but there's a lot of uh, complications with uh, collecting that data internet, uh, across the country. And, and with quite a lot of variation in um, revision rate according to state or Surgeon, do you have any sort of program that's formal within the registry organisation yeah. to, to yeah, talk to? Yeah, we do. Uh, we have a very formal program with reporting to surgeons uh, their comparative performance compared to all other surgeons, and there certainly are outlier surgeons. And we are also aware uh, that there are a number of surgeons that don't access their data, and those surgeons. Uh, unsurprisingly have uh, significantly higher revision rates. So the AOA is uh, in particular uh, focusing on how to address that particular issue and it's going to be part of the normal CPD requirements for all surgeons that they access their data but also present that to colleagues for review.